ಕರ್ಪೂರಗೌರಂ ಕರುಣಾವತಾರ ಸಂಸಾರ ಸಾರ ಭುಜಗೇಂದ್ರಹಾರ ಸದಾವಸಂತ ಹೃದಯ ಅರವಿಂದೆ ಸಹಿತ want to start off by asking you satguru what is the next step for satguru <laughs> dinner dinner <laughs> i thought that was already over so we expect a more profound answer from you <laughs> it's a very profound answer because you can postpone many things in your life you can postpone buying a home buying a car you can postpone your wedding if you want it's a good thing <laughs> you can postpone your divorce good to postpone your death but you can't postpone your dinner right now this is the ugliness which is happening in this country a whole lot of people are postponing their dinner today this is the horrible situation that's happening so do not consider dinner as not so profound it's very profound if you're eating 10 times a day it's not profound if you're eating once or if twice a day it is quite profound <laughs> so you say something which is you know which is very close to my heart you talked about dinner we no no dinner is about my stomach not my heart okay we'll we'll get to the heart through your stomach um you know we live in a we live in a world of contrast at least as i perceive it you know there is obviously the rich and the poor there are the ones who are impoverished and the satiated um you know we live in a country where 300 million people go to bed hungry every night how do we deal with these big social issues and what is the one message that you would like to give to all of us where we as individuals can make our own little big whatever contribution to being part of the solution rather than waiting for somebody else to do something now you immediately getting into the missionary mode <laughs> <laughs> we can try a little bit of that yes it's a serious problem and an unfortunate problem because we are living in a land which has over 12,000 years of agricultural history probably the only place on the planet like this as far as i know except a few other places in south america nowhere else on the planet was agriculture organized 12,000 years ago mm -hmm. so we have enormous experience of agriculture which means the science of producing food and we are living in a land where 12 months of the year you can grow what you want many farmers in tamil nadu take six crops four crops actually but in between the intercropping mm -hmm. totally six products they're taking out of the same piece of land right nowhere else on the planet this is really possible in spite of this half the people are hungry simply because of apathy not because of lack of food not because that it is not possible to fulfill this i feel a focused effort in a matter of 5 years 5 to 8 years very comfortably we can crest this it should not even take that much time but if we are determined within 5 years time it is possible to cross this and it's important to cross this because when you say india i know a lot of poetry has been written about how beautiful it is our mountains our rivers our whatever but for 1.25 billion people you neither have enough mountains nor rivers nor land not even a piece of sky mm -hmm. believe me the only thing that you have is people if these people are well nourished competent inspired this can be the greatest miracle but right now 60% of india's population even their skeletal system has not grown to full size or in other words we are producing 
are totally underdeveloped humanity. Mm -hmm. If your body does not grow to its full size, neither will your brains. There's medical evidence to show that first four years of your life, if you did not get the necessary nourishment, your brain is approximately sixty percent of what it should be. Right. So with half-brain people, the next generation, what nation are you going to build? You're going to be a big disaster. If you don't fix nourishment, we are going to be an enormous disaster. It's waiting, it's a silent bomb, it doesn't make noise. Mm -hmm. very quietly is going to implode upon us. So this is something that has to be fixed in a war footing, must be. So what is the role? I know all of us as individuals have a role to play. Um, we are all part of um, a corporate, an academic institution, part of a community and a society. So what do you believe is the responsibility? I'm not talking about corporate social responsibility. I'm simply talking about corporate responsibility when it comes to being part of fixing some of the problems that you've just spoken about. <laughs> I've... Uh, no, we are very much involved with nourishment, education, health of the rural populations. I've been talking to many leading lights. Mm -hmm. Not much light out there. <clears throat> Whenever I speak to a lot of people, not all of them, many of them, if I tell them, you know, we're planting 114 million trees, you could do something, they'll say, they'll tell me a very passionate story, how the, uh, his wife or his mother has a trust where she fl planted one hundred and eight trees mm -hmm. around their factory and how they have grown, how beautiful they are and how it… how they're enjoying it. In all this passion, I just… okay, what's there to say? One hundred and eight trees are good, I'm not saying no, but if your capacity was only one hundred and eight, I'm… I'll bow down to you. Your capacity is one hundred and eight million, mm. not one hundred and eight but you're satisfying yourself with hundred and eight. You talk about nourishment, you say, you know what, my maid's children, they were so malnourished, three of them, every Sunday we feed them. <laughs> These kind of stories I've heard of great compassion and love. <laughs> so, there is a whole culture of doing something for your satisfaction, or doing something because you want to buy a ticket to heaven. I want people to come to a place where you being fulfilled should happen within you. If you want to go to heaven, please leave <laughs> But if you want to be a solution, there's another way to work. Right. I fed two children and I feel very happy. It's all right, I appreciate that. I'm glad for those two children. But this is not a solution, this is only for satisfaction. So it's time, at least those people who are in a certain level of capability, I would say, when I say capability, all of you are thinking, oh, okay, some big corporate leader. I'm saying all of you are in a certain level of capability, who should see how to bring a solution, not do something for your silly satisfaction. You can be satisfied by eating food, by simply sitting quietly, by sleeping well, doing whatever. Satisfaction need not come through somebody else's suffering. You don't have to fulfill your satisfaction because of this, you know. Somebody's suffering, that is not the basis of your suffering. And if you buy a ticket to heaven through that suffering, I don't know, heaven will turn into hell for prob probably for you. <laughs> I hope it does. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> so I want to explore two or three other dimensions that you spoke about. You spoke about capacity, you talk, spoke about leadership. So talk to us a little bit about what you see as, what are, who are leaders and what is leadership? Is there a difference, is it? I know there's a lot of talk about leadership and wanting to become leaders. I don't think anybody should try to become a leader, it's quite obscene that I want to become a leader, that means all of you should be what? I don't know. <clears throat> I know what you would like to call yourself. 
It's not about you wanting to become a leader or someone want to be wanting to become a leader. Because of a certain thing that you have done within yourself or a certain level of observation or a certain intelligence or a certain experience, you are able to see something that most people are not able to see. The moment you're able to see something, then people will naturally look up to you as a leader because you're seeing something that they cannot see. And if you become a leader, there are many ways to become a leader. You can get elected, you can get selected, you can work it, you can pull other people down and become a leader or simply people will rise you as a leader because they see that either you're able to see something or you're able to do something which they themselves cannot do. I feel this is the way leadership should happen, if you want to call it that, that someone is able to see something and do something that others cannot do, so everybody wishes he must take charge of the situation because naturally he will be able to do something that the others will not be able to do. So what is the quality of leadership? Leadership means once you sit on a perch, you better see clearer than others, otherwise you'll make a ridiculous fool of yourself <laughs> There's a whole, you know, in mm -hmm. the nation certain things have been happening. Right. Somebody sits on a perch and he doesn't see any better than you, he looks like a fool immediately. So it is not about you wanting to sit on the perch, you wanting to see something must get you to the perch, not because you want to be above everybody else you get to the perch. So what is the quality of a leader? I don't think there's any particular quality. One thing is, a leader means his sense of life is beyond himself. It's not about his sense of identity is beyond himself. Somebody becomes a leader because he's willing to think and feel and act for more people than himself. If you act for yourself, you're called self-centered. If you just uh, act for the sake of two or three people you gather in the form of family, you are named as Dhritarasht, there are modern names for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you identify yourself with the entire nation or the world, you'll be looked at in a different way. Essentially, your leadership will come from the right context depending upon what you're identified with. Because everybody needs an identity, what sort of identity have you taken will determine the context and the quality of your leadership. In that context, um, isn't leadership something that, you know, each of us can individually manifest? If I were to describe one dimension of leadership as saying it is about taking ownership to create a better outcome, in that context, you know, we can convert leadership from a noun to a verb. I don't know that much grammar, okay <laughs> But you can try. <clears throat> See, whatever we do, every human activity, the purpose of an activity is to produce something. Mm -hmm. Production may be a safety pin, a computer, love, joy, health, well-being, it doesn't matter what. We want to produce something, when we act, we want it to be effective. How small an act or how big an act is not the important. We want something to happen effectively, which means it's a question of efficiency, it's a question of with how little, how much more you could do. That's what makes you… because all of us have the same amount of time in a day. People always tell me, Sadhguru, you had such a long day. I said, unfortunately, there's no long day, God, you know, they give me only twenty-four hours. I would like to bargain for more, but it's not happening. <laughs> you can… you can make it more mm -hmm. by in increasing your efficiency, the way you function, may including people as a part of yourself where other people will function as a part of you so that you don't have to bother about so many things around you. In this sense, you can enhance what you do. But time-wise, all of us have the same time, we can't help it. Right. So, how much can you produce, in how little time, in how much… how little material is the question. In the limited span of time which we have as life, what is it that we can do? Is it just about efficiency? Is it about simply mindless efficiency, do better, do better? No. 
at different times in history, people seem to want different things on the surface. But essentially, no matter which time of history, who they are, which part of the world they are, everybody wants the same thing, well-being. But their idea of well-being, everybody has their idea how to get there, but everybody wants well-being, no question about that. It doesn't matter which part of the world you go, whether you came here a thousand years ago or today, a hundred years later, you will see people will be still seeking well-being. In pursuit of well-being, maybe a hundred years ago somebody would be going in search of water, today you're going in search of the Wi-Fi cloud, <laughs> but <laughs> still well-being. People's idea of well-being, whatever that is, but people are only well only when something beautiful happens within themselves. They think they're going to cause it to themselves by some means. But people have been happy before the Wi-Fi came, people have been happy before the automobile came, people have been happy before all the luxuries we are enjoying today appeared. So what I'm saying is, well-being, if you're in pursuit of well-being, essentially it is about what happens within the human being. What happens within the human being in the name of so many things, I don't want to name all the things. In the name of so many things, what we call as family, society and another world which we call as corporate world, <laughs> all these things we created, these are all different names or different mechanisms that we believe will bring well-being to us. Somebody built a family, somebody built a corporation, both in pursuit of well-being, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I must tell you this, the first time I was at Davos, so many years ago, yeah. they were almost resentful. Why… what is a mystic doing in an economic summit <laughs> I… and uh, a particular CEO who was running… was in charge of uh, a top computer manufacturing company, three months later they got sold out to the Chinese <laughs> We can guess who they were <laughs> So he was very resentful, what are you doing here? Then I told him, see, what's your business? He said, I do computers. So see whether you manufacture a computer or a safety pin or in between anything. Fundamentally, this is about human well-being. The basic business is human well-being. You may do it through your computer, somebody will produce safety pin, somebody will produce a cloth, somebody will produce something else. It doesn't matter what you're doing, the ba the fundamental business is human well-being and that's my business too, and that's why I'm here <laughs> So Sadhguru, you've talked about well-being, I've… Um, you know, one of the things that you say is it's all about how the body, mind, <clears throat> emotions and most importantly energy come together and I think you've said it very eloquently, which says, you know, when the body is feeling pleasant, we call it health, if it is feeling very pleasant, we call it pleasure and so on and you go you can, on to you say… You can go all the way. Sorry? You can go all the way. I can go all the way? <laughs> so when the mind is feeling pleasant, we call it uh, joy. When it is feeling uh, very pleasant, we call it uh, peace. When the… Um, you know, when the emotion is feeling pleasant, we call it love. When it is feeling very pleasant, we call it compassion. When the energy is feeling pleasant, we call it bliss. And when it is very pleasant, we call it… You're a it very good student. So… So here's the question. Can you just elaborate on what you really mean? What is the difference between bliss and ecstasy? You know, for… Oh. for people who are not mystics, what oh. does… What does it look like? I think I need to clarify this accusation of being a mystic. <laughs> uh, on a certain day, two cows were grazing mm -hmm. on the English meadow. English cows. Got it. The Thomas Hardy kind. One cow said to the other, mm -hmm. what is your opinion about the mad cow disease? The other one said, I don't care a hoot, I'm anyway a helicopter <laughs> So what a mystic means is that there is no mistake about his perception as to who he is. Okay. 
So there are only two kinds of people, mystics and mistakes. <laughs> That's an easy one to remember. So, a mystic did not fall from somewhere else. Strive to pay attention to simple aspects of life, very simple things. Very simple things means extremely simple things. Just right now, how do you know that you're here? What is the basis, I'm asking? I am talking with you. Even when you're not speaking, you still know that you're here, right? Yeah. So how do you know? I'm perceiving what? that I am in this place, there is an audience here, we are in conversation. No, even if you close your eyes, you're still here, right? I have a right? mindfulness, I'm attentive to the fact that I'm in conversation. I'm conscious. You're conscious? I'm conscious. The reason that you know that you're here is because you're conscious. Mm -hmm. How do you know that you have a body? Because I can move my hand. So many things can move. But I am causing my hand to move. Fine, even if you don't move, you know it's there, right? Yeah. How do you know? Um. Because there is sensation in the body, yep. right? Yep. If no sensation in your body, you wouldn't know whether it's here or not. True. No consciousness, you wouldn't know whether you're here or not. Right. Yes? Yep. So these are s taken for granted things. If you pay little attention to these things, you will see there's a whole world out there, there's a whole existence by itself, just your sensation. If you pay enough attention, you know the nature of your physical existence. If you pay attention to what you're calling as my consciousness, you know the nature of your, your basic existence. Once you know the nature of your existence, that is when you can use this gadget well. I'm calling this a gadget because human mechanism is the most sophisticated mechanism on the planet. We are on top of the evolutionary heap, not for nothing. It's taken millions of years to manufacture you, yes? Yep. Not, not a simple process, an enormous process has happened to get you to this level of neurological sensitivity, sensations, awareness, everything. So these are the keys of your existence. But everybody is reading a book or they're looking into… they're looking at the cosmos through their iPhone. Nobody's paying attention to this because this is the basis of your existence. Only if you know this, you can employ this to its fullest capability. Even if you take your uh, cell phone, the more you know about it, the better you can use it, isn't it? Right. The same with this. <clears throat> so what this whole unnecessarily mm, exaggerated, exaggeration is not the word, unnecessarily uh, decorated thing about self-realization means is, you know more about this or you know everything that's worth knowing about this. That means you can use this whichever way you want. If you want to sit still here for the rest of your life, you can sit. If you want to jump out and be active, you can do. If you want to do this and that together, you can do. Whatever you want, you can do because you know the mechanism fully in its entirety, not just the physicality of it, but its entirety. So if you know this, suppose your body happens as per your instruction, your mind happens as per your instruction, your life energies happen as per your instruction, how will you keep it? Pleasant or unpleasant? Pleasant. Pleasant. At least for yourself, highest level of pleasantness. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but <laughs> what you want for yourself is clear. So when you mean… when you want pleasantness, now generally if you are very pleasant, we say you are blissful. Now, bliss can get boring sometimes, okay? <laughs> yes, Good pleasantness gets boring, isn't it, sometimes? You want some slosh to happen, now you use ecstasy. But that slosh cannot be kept up. Bliss can be kept for your entire life. Ecstasy cannot be kept for your entire life. You go up and you come down. Or in other words, bliss is a sustainable level of pleasantness the height of pleasantness. Ecstasy is not sustainable, but you can hit it often enough, at least a few times in a day you must hit it.